everybody. You are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. The worst thing you can possibly do for yourself is put too much of your money in an individual name, and then when something goes wrong, you sell for emotional reasons. So there's even diversification, guys, within the equity investment basket here. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? I mean, even if you're just going to have all stocks, you got to make sure that you're diversifying and not putting all of the money you have into one stock. Yes. Hey, everyone. I'm super excited about my guest today because he is a former colleague and more importantly, a friend. And over the years, we have navigated a lot of uh, situations in the capital markets, and he is absolutely an expert with a vision. So I would like to introduce to you, without further ado, Dea Pernas. And Dea has started his own equity research company called uh, Pernas Research with his brother, Dean. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty of exactly what equity research is and how we can all benefit from it and incorporate that into our investment strategy. And I'm also going to speak today about his very interesting career trajectory because he has had some pivots along the way. And as you guys know, we love to talk about people who change their careers every now and then because of their passion or whatever else is going on in their mind. So we're going to cover a lot of topics today. Um, And for those of you that are really interested in the nitty gritty of investment research and selection of equity uh, positions, this is the podcast for you to listen to today. So Dea, thank you uh, for joining me today. Without further ado, this is Dea Pranas. Where are you located today? And um, how are you feeling about being on this podcast the fiscal feminist. Hello, everybody. Uh, as, as Kim had stated, we've been friends now for over a decade, and I'm uh, very, very thankful to be here on her podcast and watch our, her career uh, continue to grow. Uh, and hopefully, we can do more of these things in the future. Uh, but as far as where I, I am currently, I'm in Houston, Texas. Part of the change that I made, uh, kind of leaving my former employer to do, uh, you know, what's really a startup a research firm, was I wanted to start somewhere completely new that I've never lived before. I think uh, when you're doing something new, sometimes it's good to shake up the biorhythms, and that's really what I'm doing. It's good to have a sort of fresh perspective on a lot of things, and uh, I do intend to move back to California at some point, but currently I reside in uh, Houston, Texas. Well, I applaud you for that because everyone's always saying that people want to move from California to Texas and will never come back to California. As someone who lives in Southern California, I would disagree because I love California, even with high taxes. So I met Daya at Morgan Stanley when I was there uh, many years ago, and he was an analyst, a branch analyst, I believe, at Morgan Stanley when I met him. And then we both went on to be partners at the Bonson Group, where I am currently a managing director and partner uh, in our wealth management practice. But prior to that, I believe you went to Berkeley, you were in the Air Force. So you've, you know, you've got some history there of setting you up for success over the years um, in your background. So anyway, let me just ask you, okay, so you were in the Air Force, you went to Berkeley. How, let's just start, first of all, how did you end up at Morgan Stanley? And why did you choose that particular gig? So as far as uh, Morgan Stanley was concerned, really, I was just trying to get a job at, in finance. And at the time, uh, it was around 2010 or so. It was a bit of a difficult uh, situation for the financial industry, actually for employment uh, in general, employment was close to 10%, or unemployment was close to 10%, excuse me. And uh, finance was especially hit hard uh, after the global financial crisis. So what I was trying to do was just apply to as many financial places as possible and try to be an analyst somewhere. And uh, fortunately, uh, Morgan Stanley and uh, another firm were able to interview me, and I, I ended up selecting Morgan Stanley. And what was great about that role was, was that it had a rotational bent to it. So one of the things that I advise interns and people that are getting uh, going into the job market for the first time is to have some sort of bias towards rotational roles where 
they may not be sure exactly what niche they want to belong in. So it's helpful to have a more panoramic view of a certain industry or a certain sub industry or, or what have you. So I was able to do that in my role. It was, uh, it was rotational in the sense that I had spent a lot of time with management, spent a lot of time looking at portfolios, sp even spent some time in operations. So you, I got this really good view of wealth management. The official role was wealth management analyst. So I, I got a really uh, kind of great global view of what it's like to be a wealth management analyst. And do you, I mean, uh, just out of curiosity for anyone who might be listening and might be interested in that kind of position, are these positions still available in the kind of big you know, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch type environment? Because I do think it's really good training for people who might want to go on to get their CFA, which you have. And can you tell people what a CFA is? Absolutely. Uh, so first thing is, is all these banks and financial institutions are constantly, constantly experimenting with different roles, with different analyst roles, uh, trying to see what works, the demographics and the employee group uh, cohort is always changing and they're and they're always uh, trying to find ways to effect, effectively source uh, you know better uh, employees so uh, I, they'll always have some sort of analyst programs whether it's titled wealth management analyst or not uh, there will always be uh, good analyst programs that, that I think are very well worth looking into if you are considering the field as far as uh, chartered financial analysts which is the designation that I have it's one that is very heavy in analytics. So one of the things that was good about what I was doing is that I knew that I had wanted to do it for the very, very long term. I was lucky in a sense that I had found what I wanted to do for the next 10 or 20 years. And that was really analysis. I, I didn't care what my position was, or what my title was, or how much money I was making. I knew that I wanted to be an analyst. I knew that I wanted to have intellectually stimulating work around uh, companies, uh, financial markets, and trying to digest all this information to make decisions. So the CFA is a designation that, that helps you enhance those, those capabilities and shows the industry that you're serious about this line of work because it is one that takes a, a great deal of effort in studying. There's three levels. It takes about four years to acquire the designation or so. So it lets Central employers and the broader industry know that you're very, very serious about your line of work. So, so that, and, and, you know, that's what I wanted to not only do, but to present to the, uh, to the outside world. So when you were growing up, did you have a, a real interest in investment in the stock market and capital markets or just as you grew older? Like, was this some kind of innate interest that you had? I had uh, an innate interest in statistics, probabilities, financial markets. I had innate interest in decision-making in the face of uncertain information. And I thought that financial markets could be a wonderful laboratory for me to uh, try to apply and grow my intellectual capabilities, really. So it was fascinating to me in its complexity, in its uncertainty, and that was a huge attraction for me. So, so that was really what drew me in there. And then it was a, a slowly by slowly, I, 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 as I digested more information, I, I started to like it more and more and more. And my affinity for the field just kind of grew from there. So when Dea was working with me, he was the co-CIO, which means chief investment officer, co-chief investment officer. And he basically was analyzing all the potential options that we had to invest in. And he would look at our portfolio allocations along with our CIO and our investment committee. And he was doing that in the context of helping our clients invest their money in a way that made sense for what the client's goals and time horizons were and all of that kind of stuff. So that's what you were doing. And then you decided to pivot because you wanted to to become an equity researcher and you wanted to start a business with your brother. So what I'd like you to explain to us is what is the difference between what you were doing and what you are now doing that is solely focused on equity research and what is equity research? That's uh, a great question. So what I was doing previously, I think what I'm doing now is 
uh, a more focused component of what I was doing previously. And previously, you know, I found my work at, to, at my former employer to be very satisfying, and that was putting together broad portfolios for clients and tying those portfolios to the objective of those clients. And a, a large part of that is investing some of that capital, and it ranges in different amounts, uh, and you're investing some of that capital in the equity market, in the stock market. So you have to do research on different individual names that you place client capital in. And doing research on those individual names was just one component of the many, many things that I was doing, which was when you're putting together portfolios for clients, you're not only looking at equities, you're looking at alternatives, you're looking at fixed income, you're looking at how much to have in cash, you're looking at how much income to generate, you're looking, at, you're spending a lot of time focusing on macro and so on. So really right now, I'm j it's just focusing on that equity component. So, and as far as uh, being an equity analyst, what, it, what an equity analyst is, and when the word equity is really just tying, you know, to, to just boil to it down stock. to a very simple level, right, it's just, uh, it's just talking about stocks, it's talking about a, a company that you have an ownership share. In. So all an equity analyst is, is trying to gain an understanding of that company, what that company does well, what that company does poorly, how that company plays within its broader ecosystem, what that company's competitors are like, what the people that run that company, what is their strategy like? And you're trying to gain a sense of how this company is going to evolve in the future. So right now, uh, what I'm doing is strictly publishing equity uh, research. And why I thought it was timely is because I looked around at the broader marketplace and I thought that there was just a dearth of high quality research. And the research that was out there, I thought, wasn't done in the way that I think is best. And it was being produced by entities that I didn't think had the right incentive alignment with their readers. So I felt it was a great opportunity because I, I just didn't see anything out there that I had in mind to produce. So for our um, audience who might think this is a little high level, right? Because this is kind of another layer of finance and inv the investment world that a lot of people really don't see if they're retail investors, so to speak. So you were saying that some of these other research uh, groups were not aligned with the investors. So can you expound a little bit on what you mean by that? So if you look at the stock research industry, if you look at how stock research is published and distributed in the market today, it's really centered around large investment banks. Investment banks like Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, these banks have relationships with the public companies that they produce research for. And oftentimes it's an economic relationship. So they're incentivized to be more favorable about these companies or their evaluation of these companies than they might be uh, if it was purely objective. So there, there exists an inherent conf conflict of interest to how this research is uh, produced. So really we were trying to fix this design flaw in the creation of, of our firm. So who is your audience? Like, is it someone like me as a regular retail person, not as a managing director or investment uh, professional, but just, you know, me, Kim, the investor, I want to get like the Motley Fool or something, you know, a, a newsletter or some research newsletter. Could I sign up for your newsletter and would... I be able to trust in what you're putting forth because you're not getting paid by the other big companies, banks to get your newsletter. How's that working? So I think, I think that's a great question. I think that um, right now our research is open to the public and I would encourage anybody who's listening, who's interested in investing to sign up. Uh, right now we're trying to brand and we still haven't started with our marketing strategy. We just, we just launched the beginning of this year. So we're still uh, building a momentum and, and getting going. First, before we move on, how can they sign up? Go to pronosresearch.com and subscribe. And the subscription takes uh, two seconds. Okay, perfect. And then they'll be able to get our uh, investment ideas to come out once a month. So as far as the uh, incentive element, so I think that one thing our uh, subscribers can be certain of is that there is that alignment of interest because it's actually why we exist. We wouldn't have launched our business otherwise if we weren't able to solve for this previously mentioned design flaw. And really, it's uh, around trying to tie our stock ideas to actual performance. I, it, I, we don't believe it makes sense to put out a lot of stock ideas and recommendations 
if you don't go back and say, here's how these recommendations have done since we put them out. I think it's a very basic thing, but, the, but to my knowledge, almost zero researchers uh, display and market their performance. So we aim to uh, solve for that, and it's one of, the, uh, one of the ways that we aim to fix this problem. The, sec the second way is we actually have real money invested in alongside our research recommendations. So uh, we have a good deal of pers uh, personal assets, my brother and I, that are invested along our recommendations. So our readers can be have a tangible assuredness that our recommendations are aligned, you know, uh, the incentives. You have skin in the game. Uh, uh, perfectly said. I, I, I love that uh, phrase. We have, we have skin. Right, because if, if you make a bad recommendation, you're going to lose money. So let me just ask a couple of questions about this, and then I want to go back a little bit to the establishment of the business. So will you be like uh, providing a monthly report card to newsletter people saying, okay, or how often are you going to report on performance? Because some of this might be really a long hold. Some of it might be only a few months. How often are you, every month, are you sending out a thing saying, okay, here's what happened this month in this investment, and this is why we think we should keep it or not keep it? So I think, I think that's a really good point, especially if people who are following along. We constantly provide updates to our open positions. Open positions meaning that uh, companies that we have issued a buy recommendation on. So if anything changes okay. with that name, uh, meaning we either like it less or like it more, we'll put out an update on that specific stock that lets our readers know. And when we do decide to eventually close out of the name and say, look, it's either reached our price target or we don't want to follow this name for any other reason, uh, that's, of course, something that uh, we will update our, our readers on. As far as uh, performance goes, we maintain an active list of our performance. It's updated daily on all our uh, open buy recommendations. And then we also have a list of every recommendation we've ever made uh, from when we published the initial recommendation to when we closed out the position and how it did in that interim. So uh, our performance per position is is front and center and uh, dynamic. So when you're looking at companies, what is it that you are looking for? Are you getting into a deep dive of their balance sheet, their profit margins? Are you doing fundamental analysis of these companies that are issuing the stock? So basically, as I tell my clients, when you are buying a stock, you're buying part of a company. You own part of a company. So we at the Bonson Group, are pretty much bottom-up fundamental investors. So what are you looking at to make these recommendations? What makes you recommend one stock over another? So what you're trying to gain understanding of is what this company's cash flow is going to look like in the future. And oftentimes, maybe it's just too hard or too complicated. Like, for example, some certain biotech names, no matter how we could read, 100,000 of pages on the industry and, and different companies, we still may not have a good understanding of things or how, how things are going to unfold in the future. So we, we, we try to focus on things that are a bit more predictable. And what we're trying to gain uh, an idea of is how these cash flows will evolve. And once, if, if and when we gain an understanding of how these cash flows can evolve, then we can actually value the company. Because... We believe the value of a company is equal to the cash that it generates over its life. You got to discount it back, but uh, and that that should make intuitive sense to most people. Like, and so you're projecting what their cash flow is going to be going into the future. Yes, exactly. So that you can discount it back to value it now. Yes. And so the projections about what's going to happen in the future. You're gleaning that. You're figuring that out from information the company is providing you with plus stuff that, like what you're thinking market conditions in that industry might be? How are you determining that? It's a, it's a litany of things. It centers around a, a few things, and the list can change based on the company, but it's usually you have to have a really good understanding of the industry, of the ecosystem that the company operates in. You have to have a really good understanding of the competitors, and not just today, the competitors in the future. You have to have a really good understanding of the trends and forces that are acting upon this industry. And then you can start thinking more micro, as in the company's strategy, the company's competitive advantages, what their balance sheet looks like. Uh, at the end of the day, if they're a great company, but they're really highly leveraged, 
uh, maybe some downward cycle could be enough to take them out. So you have to, that has to be a consideration. So there's a, a number of things to look at to gain confidence of how that company is going to be positioned going forward. So uh, for the mere, you know, so mere mortals who may only have, let's say, $50,000 and they want to, you know, people go on Robin Hood or whatever. And I don't even know how people do research or where they get their information from. And one of the things that I'm always talking about is I think it's a little dangerous to blindly pick things to invest in without any knowledge about what they are or because you're, you know, kind of talking to a bunch of gals or dudes and they're saying, oh, I invested in that. And so you just do it because your your friend did it. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is it has been said that if you use or like something, so I ride a Peloton, so I like my Peloton, so I'm going to invest in Peloton because I like my Peloton. So I've heard a lot of people, and especially Finfluencers, people who are now in the market espousing things for people to invest in, they themselves may not have a background in finance, but somehow they find themselves having these platforms. But I have heard it a lot, and I know Warren Buffett had said it at one time, uh, and I don't know exactly in what context, but if you know something and you use it and you like it, whether it's a Peloton or, I don't know, some other kind of, or Lululemon, you know, leggings, whatever it is, then that's something you should invest in. I've always thought that was kind of a crazy way to invest because I might love my Peloton, but Peloton might be managed like not very well and be a completely crappy company. And in fact, Peloton did take a bit of a nosedive with its stock price, I believe last year. But the point being is, is that a good thing to invest money based on? What's your take on that? Yeah, I think there's a few things there. And uh, yeah, this whole Peter Lynch idea of uh, you want to invest in things that you know well, I think holds some water, but you know, clearly there are some nuances. And to maybe zoom out and to start with the original uh, part of your question, which was, hey, this, this take your average person or whoever who's thinking about investing and they have like 50 or 100,000, is it a, a good idea or could it even potentially be harmful for them to start picking stocks or, or what have you? And I think the answer to that is, I, I think they need to be very, very careful uh, about the risks they're taking. I think it, it's, uh, you know, obviously uh, the money that they do decide to invest should be well diversified. That being said, and there's plenty of ways to do that using ETFs or funds or uh, you know SMAs or so on. That being said, I would always recommend that people do pick stocks with at least a very small portion of the portfolio, even if it's one, two, three, or four percent of the portfolio. And I would recommend that because it, it it gets them more engaged and thinking like actual owners of the business. And once you can actually start to look at certain companies and realize, oh, I own a uh, I'm actually a part owner in this business. Right. I don't just own some passive ETF and this ETF owns 5,000 different stocks. And uh, you know, it, it seems that that starts getting really intangible for me, where if you actually own part of a company, then there is a level of engagement there. You might want to start to understand how that company is doing business. Uh, you might want, want to understand who their customers are, what, how they provide value to society uh, through their customers. So I think that level of engagement is healthy. Clearly, you, you can. Uh, there is the other side of it. When to, if, if you start getting uh, more too concentrated and you start uh, using a large portion of your portfolio to buy individual names, when you don't exactly have the expertise to do the type of analysis, let's say that we're doing, then that can it could be a, a you know obviously a, a weakness and a vulnerability. But if it's done at a, a small level, I, I think that that's a very healthy thing for people who are investing. So where do you get your information from? So someone like um, a normal, you know, person who's, say, on Vanguard or Robinhood, they can get some information through those various companies on the service, you know, on the platform. But where are you getting your information for? Are you paying for, you know, expensive services that provides you with this kind of in-the-know information? Like, I'm trying to give a retail investor some kind of idea about how complex the universe of your of your research information and where you're getting your information is from so that they understand the complexity of actually kind of doing this type of analysis. So I've used all sorts of different data aggregators, uh, research providers, any sort of software out there, whether it's Bloomberg, 
FactSet, Reuters, Coifin, I've used them all. And some are better than others in, in, in different types of ways. What I will say is most of them are just aggregating uh, information that is public. So uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, the stock exchange uh, or the company, let's say, is required to disclose certain filings. And these research providers, they take all this information, they scrape it and make it really, really nice and available for you. And it's helpful in terms of uh, saving some time. But almost all the information you really need to do a proper analysis of the company is the company filings, is the earnings transcripts of the company, and then you're, have to, you're, have, you're going to have to understand the industry the company operates in. You're going to have to read uh, different industry reports. You're going to have to read uh, certain, you know, uh, certain publications by consulting firms. You're going to actually have to reach out to insiders of that industry to get an idea, uh, you know, a firsthand view, or, or at least uh, reality check some of the stuff you're learning about the industry. So and you mentioned uh, Peloton earlier. Well, maybe you, got, you want to have an idea of, how good are these bikes? So you talk to certain customers or you talk to, uh, you try to find out who their suppliers are or what kind of material this is made out of and what the competitor is doing. So these are all uh, questions that don't, it, it, there's, it's not some magic spreadsheet out there or some magic research provider that has all these a- answers. At the end of the day, it's hard work in asking the right questions and that having the discipline to follow up and answer all your questions in entirety. And after you do that, you start to form an idea of, uh, you start to form a conviction of how good this company really is. So, you know, I think the the upshot is there's a lot of information out there that's available to all of us, but we're all busy doing our jobs. So we don't have time to really parse through a lot of it when we're trying to figure out what to invest in. And that is why someone like yourself and the service that you're providing gives people a little bit of insight into certain stocks based on your analysis and your projections and opinion that over time might actually have um, a payout to them with an increased price. So on that note, what kind of timeline for return are you looking at when you're making these recommendations? Do you care that it might be five years or do you want it to be in six months or does none of that matter? It's just the fundamentals are where the company is and you have a belief that at some point they're going to hit pay dirt? A little bit of both. I think, well, I'll get to the timeline in a second, but we, we generally will never put a buy recommendation out on a company unless we think there's an opportunity to, own, to, to earn 30% or more rate of return by investing in that company. Uh, we published recommendations where the upside is 30%. We published recommendations where the upside is well over 100%. And as far as achieving that rate of return, our window for achieving that rate of return is from 18 to 24 months, about a year, anywhere from a year and a half to 24 months. And the reason for that is, is, is there's a good amount of studies out there that will show that if you're correct about how a company is developing and you think that company is trading way lower than it should be, it takes about a year and a half to two years for the market to reprice to your expectations. So that's why our recommendation would be to wait about a year and a half to two years. And if we haven't achieved that rate of return in that time frame, something might have went wrong. It's possible that our analysis wasn't completely correct, in which case we would absolutely uh, notify our readers or, or some other situation. Maybe the facts changed uh, in a way that was completely unforeseeable and we've had to adjust our position. And are these are these companies that are usually... Small cap companies, smaller companies that are getting these in 18 months, you know, 100% or even 30% price rise. I mean, are are they a particular kind of company generally or can a mature company fit into this? A mature company could definitely fit, fit in, into it. Our market cap range is anywhere from $250 million to $10 million. And really our starting universe is at any stocks. I mean, they can't be too small. But yeah, so the idea is to go from the 10,000 or so stocks that is the universe, and we run many different screens to try to prune that down to something that, to a, what we call a candidate list. And the screens that we run are around uh, leverage, around declining revenue growth. Uh, sometimes we'll actually look for companies that have had revenue growth declines, uh, that may be counterintuitive, 
Uh, we look for things like uh, EV to EBITDA, certain multiples, and um, also things like uh, DNA to CapEx and so on that might indicate whether a company is cash flowing more heavily than the uh, financial statements suggest. But all, all that is to try to get down to a group of about 50 names that we then can go through one by one in a more qualitative kind of way before we eliminate it or before we green light it for a deeper dive. So the companies can range from uh, th- there could be a wide divergence of market caps between the smaller ones and the larger ones. So with all that's been going on with inflation and possible recession, how does that affect your analysis? So what it does is it, create, it creates a bit of opportunity. We enjoy seeing volatility in the market be, uh, because it means that, okay, some names are selling off at least. The worst thing for us as researchers that are trying to find bargains is when the market is going straight up year after year after year. Right, because everybody can just put their money in an index fund and make money and you don't have to think about it. That too. And everything seems to be trading above its actual value in, in those types of... Because I, I was reading today in uh, one of the reports that we get at work, I, at Strategus, you know who they are. Um, and, you know, it was saying that, or maybe it was the Wall Street Journal. I can't remember because I read a lot of stuff every day. But anyway, I was reading that a lot of companies, the bankruptcy rate of companies has, has grown significantly in this past year because a lot of companies were surviving that shouldn't have because they had very, very cheap debt that was keeping them alive. And now this debt's being, you know, the, it's it's expiring and they have to refinance it and they can't get that same kind of debt and they can't afford the higher interest rates. So they're declaring bankruptcy. So that is kind of something that you think, well, back a few years ago, everything looked like sunshine and lollipops. And now this company is going down the tubes. So I want to make sure that, you know, people understand that inflation and recession can somehow affect the health of a company. So yes, it is often an opportunistic opportunity to buy companies that are actually going to perform well over time at maybe a cheaper rate. But how do you parse through whether they, these are like not going to suffer from these kinds of uh, outside forces that are happening, you know? Uh, absolutely. And I think that this is a, a great topic into why macro is important for stock pickers. And, uh, I, you know, some people say they're pure bottom up. At, at, and that does make sense. I understand how you could just look at a company and try to forget everything else that's going on. But that company does exist in the world. And these outside forces like interest rates, like inflation, do affect this company. So that's, that's also, to, to me, why having a good macro foundation is essential even if you are a pure micro, you know, just only looking at stocks. And for us, how we uh, try to decide whether or not a company is going to do well in, let's say, this environment is number one, uh, the first thing, first and foremost thing we look at uh, when there could be uh, a recession and it's difficult to to plot where interest rates are going to be is the debt level. And uh, funny thing, if a company doesn't have any debt, it can't go bankrupt. So first, first and foremost, if you look at a company that doesn't have any debt and it's getting sold off like companies with a lot of debt, maybe that's an opportunity. I think I spoke to you uh, briefly about you know companies in the discretionary space, consumer discretionary space. You did. And I'd like you to give us like a real world example of something that you might recommend in consumer discretionary, if that's something you'd like to have as the example, because I love, and just on a, on a basic thing for all humans, because you know, guys, I talk a lot about personal finance. If you don't have debt, you can't go bankrupt. Now, it also would be helpful if you had cash flow coming in too, so you can just pay everything, you know, without debt, but you need to have some money coming in. But debt will, it, whether you're a human, just an individual or a company, if you have too much of it, it will dog you forever yes, yes. and it de- doesn't end well. So, and I know that from personal experience and I've got to say, I'm about, I'm going to, my next podcast is going to be called Debt, Diet and Alcohol. And those three things are the things that I, I have to uh, really work hard on uh, <laughs> to have moderation with. But okay, so I want a, a real world example so that the uh, audience understands like, how you're thinking about some of this stuff. And also in light of 
prices are going up. So consumer discretionary, you know, things are getting more expensive for people to go buy, you know, shoes and clothes and whatever. And if there's a recession, again, fewer people might be buying fewer of these goods. So give us an example of something you would recommend now, why you're recommending it, and if it looks contrary and why, why you think you're right. Yes. And I think the landscape is, uh, is tricky, as you suggested, because there are a lot of companies out there that exist that probably should have never existed. They, their business model, the, the, the conceptual integrity of their business model was not sound. They were surviving on debt and the debt was very, very cheap and credit markets were open for business. So they were able to continue to survive. So you need to be very, very careful around companies that have debt. And that being said, if you find some companies that don't have debt or, or that have a manageable level of debt, especially given the amount of money they're making, uh, I think you'll, you could find some opportunities in the consumer discretionary space. Uh, now, let me just make a caveat. The consumer discretionary space is one where it gets, sell, that gets sold off pretty heavily in the onset of a recession, and it makes sense. Uh, people buy less and less discretionary items. Uh, uh, think about your uh, you know, average, your mid-tier purse or whatever it is. People are going to buy less accessories. So, and also why, at that point, staples might be doing a little bit better because I may not need to go buy a Yves Saint Laurent purse, but I still have to buy toothpaste. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So you, uh, you might shelf some of the uh, purse purchases, but obviously those necessities you're still going to have to go buy. Now, the reason why we think discretionary could be interesting is because some of these names get sold off pretty violently. And if a name gets sold off pretty violently, we look at it as an opportunity because it, there's a potential that it could be trading at a bargain. So right now, one of the names that we're looking at is uh, a retail company few people have heard of, I think. And it's one that's called Zoomies. And uh, they're in about 600 stores throughout the country. And uh, they're mostly in malls, but they sell, it's, it's a retail, it sells, think of like streetwear combined with like Hot Topic, edgy kind of apparel for, uh, for a younger demographic. And they have no debt. They have 44 years of successful operating history. They manage through many, many different cycles. Uh, they sell brands that you can't really find anywhere else. And the stock is down, I think, oh, uh, you know, well over uh, 60% since highs uh, or, you know, or uh, I forget the, the exact percentage amounts down, but it's gotten beaten up quite heavily. And the, this is also a company that generally emerges stronger as a result of cyclical downturns. They have, str- they have a strong balance sheet. They put that balance sheet. And to how work. long have they been in business? They've been in business uh, about over 40 years. Wow. So what were they selling 40 years ago? There wasn't like streetwear and skatewear then. What were they selling? It really started around uh, around the 90s uh, or the 80s or 90s or so. They didn't start off as uh, as streetwear. The actual founder of the firm, Tom Campion, and uh, Hakkasan, his, his co-founder, they were they had left from JCPenney. So these are former JCPenney employees, and uh, they were trying to copy that, but except at a smaller scale. The company back then was actually called Above the Belt. Okay. But then, uh, being the, the good retailers that they were, they, they saw this trend around the 80s uh, or 90s where uh, this kind of skatewear type industry started to become popular. And they really positioned their products to sell to what they thought was this emerging trend. And they were correct. And I think a lot of companies like, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of other companies started to emerge in that time frame. I, I believe uh, Paxson was one of them. I mean, don't quote me on that, but there were other competitors that have started to emerge to capture some of this streetwear trend back then. So that was, that was really, yeah, they're great retailers. Okay, so for, and so it's the same basic, not, well, I don't know, 40 years, but the management is been able to exist for 40 years in the same company without going down the tubes. Exactly. Which which tells you a lot about a retailer because there are no, there is no shortage of retailers that have gotten bankrupt through cycles. I mean, if you think about most of your favorite retailers, uh, Quicksilver, uh, Hot to- uh, or I mentioned Hot Topic, but I don't think they, they went bankrupt. Uh, PacSun, um, are there any number of retailers that go bankrupt through cycles because they don't manage their debt levels properly, they expand too fast, they don't manage their inventory properly, they start falling off right. their goods. There are all sorts of sins that retailers commit. But the, they have been very, very cautious and conservative in their growth. And... Uh, it, it shows in their income statement, they've been able to practically never have an unprofitable year over, the, over that stretch of, uh, or at least the stretch they've been public. 
And uh, that's what you want from a retailer. You want somebody who's uh, managed well. They don't get carried away when things are times are too good. And when times are bad, they start investing in their business. So this is a company that has bricks and mortar stores. So they have to carry inventory in stores. They have to pay rent. And why? So let's just say, and they're down. Uh, well, I think what their revenues are, are down, I think, because you had mentioned these guys to me at some point, I did a little research, so it didn't sound like a complete ninny. But their net income seemed to be down a good percentage, maybe 60, 70% this year. So why do you think that over the next couple of years, because they've got carrying costs with their rent, their inventory, they have to have salespeople in the stores. They're not, I don't know if they're a big online presence that can counter that. But what is it that is making you feel like, besides the fact that they have no debt, like we think they can kind of navigate the maybe a recession that's coming up and and come out the other end really victorious? I think that it's, it's a few things. As far as their costs, uh, you had mentioned for a retailer, the costs are always going to be the same. It's uh, the, the major costs are going to be inventory, occupancy costs, and labor. And for them, they're, the way they're, they structure their leases uh, are such that they can get out of certain leases if they're unprofitable uh, when they want to. They're very intelligent about the negotiations with these different landlords. So uh, I think as a retailer, you have to be, be careful about how you expand. Number two, uh, a lot of their workforce is seasonal. Uh, it tends to be part, part-time laborers, and there's a lot of flexibility there. And number three, as far as uh, as as far as their general expansion or corporate costs, they're they're still able to. There's multiple ways where they can manage costs if needed. But here's the thing: they don't really have to because although it is going to be a tough environment for the next year, maybe two years, eventually the cycle will turn, and they will be as profitable as they always were. So. We often find there's opportunities to buy certain stocks when the short term looks kind of scary, but the long term looks okay. And do they have a lot of cash reserves and liquidity to carry them through given their net incomes down? Do they have, is that a factor in this? You're looking and saying, well, they've, they've got the reserves to make it through a couple of years that may not be great. Absolutely. And this is why having a good balance sheet, especially in tough times, is so important. Because not only does it allow you to survive, which is... The number one thing you should expect out of any company you invest in is this company going to survive, first and foremost. It allows you to be more aggressive when everybody else is very, very fearful, which they happen to be. And their liquidity is, the actual cash on hand, forget about a, a revolver or anything, is, is close to a couple hundred million dollars. So even though their net income uh, might decline a little bit, they have ample cash. And, and it's, that cash is very, very important. If that cash wasn't there, we would have a different opinion, obviously. Okay. So, so again, you know, just guys, they're, these guys, Daya and Dean, they're doing a deep dive. They're looking at, you know, debt. They're looking at the macro environment of the economy. They're looking at liquidity. They're looking at net income. They're looking at the whole industry and where this particular company fits in. Because, you know, I want to caution everyone that if you're very young, you can have just 100% equities as your investment, but you need to have a long time horizon because you're going to have some ups and downs. So, you know, my whole thing is always telling everybody to diversify. So you have some equities, you have got some fixed income, you've got some alternatives that are those uncorrelated investments. But if you are someone who really likes to be a stock picker, or you want to really get involved in that kind of world because you know, it is very interesting and you can make a lot of money. I mean, you know, there are many people out there, you know, well-known investors who have done so. Jaya, what would you say to people who are like, wow, this is really interesting. I want to learn more. I love this idea of like, you know, picking a basket of stocks that I kind of work, I work with and see how I go. What are the risks inherent in this and how should people set themselves up? Should they be prepared that they might lose all their money so they shouldn't put all their money in this? Or uh, should they be prepared to just realize that for two years they might have to hold something and if they really need the money, not be able to sell it because it might be down for a little while before it goes up? What what would you say, not only for people listening, but even for yourself as someone who's putting money into these investments, what are the risks and what are you doing to make sure that you're mitigating those risks so that they're not outsized? Yes. I think when you're investing in individual stocks, uh, and especially let's say you're a listener and you haven't maybe dabbled in a little bit or maybe medium out, 
And number one, you have to understand risks and you have to be uh, prepared to deal with the risks. So that's, all, that's why, number, first and foremost, I err on the side of caution. When you're investing in an individual name, and this also goes for stuff that we invest in, as much as work as, as we do trying to gauge the risk to a certain company's cash flows or a business model, there is no company that we ever put out a buyer recommendation on that is going to be immune from a large market sell-off. So anything that we have, that we own, that we put out a recommendation on, can sell off substantially if the market sells off. So there, all, there always exists the possibility that you will lose money, at least on paper. And you have to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, 20, 30, 40% downswings in an individual name. And would you say to people in that situation, it's prudent to just hold on to it? Or do you have to look at why they're down? Is it just down because there's market contagion or are they down because they suck? I, and I think that that's also why you have to put, you have to have a, such a, a small amount in there where you're not forced to make an emotional decision. The worst thing you can possibly do for yourself is put too much of your money in an individual name. And then when something goes wrong, you sell for emotional reasons. So there's even diversification, guys, within the equity investment sleep, you know, uh, basket here. Where, absolutely, absolutely. Right? I mean, even if you're just going to have all stocks, you got to make sure that you're diversifying and you're kind of not putting all of the money you have into one stock because that's not good if that stock happens to go bluey. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, this is a fascinating topic. And one of the reasons I really wanted to do this podcast today is we talk about investing and often people have a lot of ETFs or mutual funds and, you know, they just kind of put their money in there and hope for the best, right? But it is a fascinating uh, topic because these are companies and over the history of the stock market, that is how people have made the most amount of money, even with the ups and downs, is through stock market um, appreciation. And I do want people to understand that investing in equities isn't something that you can do kind of uh, in a cavalier way. It's about information and parsing through the information and trying to make an informed decision. And that goes for whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund or it's an you know individual stock picking like what Day is talking about. So I want to ask you two more questions before we wrap up because we're already at 50 minutes. I can't believe mm -hmm. it. I could talk to you for a long time. I think we could have like a course on this. Yes. Maybe we will have a course on this. But if you were going to advise somebody listening to this podcast now who is not, you know, uh, who has kind of limited investment knowledge, has an interest, how could they get started? What would you advise? Let's just assume they have maybe $50,000 what would you tell them to do? Go on Robinhood, go to Vanguard, or do some individual stock picking by looking at the public information out there. What would your advice be? So I think that, uh, let's, so let's say you have your rainy day fund and now you have some money to invest uh, and you're thinking about ETFs or individual stocks or so on. So, I, and I do want to say, as you mentioned, ETFs, uh, you know, obviously can be a good idea to help you achieve diversification and so on. And if you do have an interest in individual stocks, which I which I am an advocate of and hope everybody does because I do think it's exciting. First and foremost, I would recommend you just trying to learn more. And I think that a, a really good book, a starter book for everybody is uh, Peter Lynch's A uh, One Up on Wall Street. I think Peter Lynch is one of the few communicators uh, in the investment world that explains things in such a crystal clear way that I'm, I'm often just, I, I admire him a ton for being able to communicate the way he does. He's, he's absolutely fantastic. So it's called One Up on Wall Street, Peter Lynch. And really, he writes a book to the retail investor that says, look, don't get intimidated by these Wall Street guys. Yeah, they may have all these algorithms or uh, technology or information. But at the end of the day, if you can do certain things right, you can win. And uh, the, I think the book is absolutely correct in its messaging. And uh, if you're... If you're starting to develop curiosity, I, I think you should definitely pick it up. Well, and you should also subscribe to the newsletter. Yes, yes. The day is doing. I want to ask you another question, which isn't about the actual equity research and stock picking. It's more about when you decided to pivot in your career, because I think this is a very interesting question also for many of our the people in our audience. And you're going to start this business with your brother 
moved to Texas from California. What did you do to prepare for yourself in your personal finance realm? Did you make sure that you had a lot of cash reserved in case, you know, you didn't start making money in this for a while? Did you, I don't know, like how, how, because you were going to have to invest some money into this business. Had you been preparing for a while? What were the steps that you took to say, okay, I can now quit my job where I'm getting paid on a regular basis to start this entrepreneurial endeavor without, you know, literally having sleepless nights and wringing your hands and gnashing your teeth because you were petrified after you did that? Yes. I think first and foremost, I think before somebody starts an entrepreneurial endeavor, and I think it's great that people have these persuasions and uh, just, just these exciting kind of ideas that they want to go pursue. I think that it's important to have the right expectations. And I believe one of the things that we did well is understanding how difficult it is. And uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to get a business up and going, especially from, uh, from zero. So number one, you have to understand that there's going to be uh, many, many months, if not years, of struggle. Right. And because of that, you need to have the proper financing available. So I think that uh, you need to be conservative in your estimates and you need to have enough money uh, kind of saved away to be able to support you through this difficult time period. And, you know, clearly it involves some sacrifice in your earlier years trying to make, uh, make those savings. But if you're really, really serious about entrepreneurship, it's something that's essential. It's something that can help you. The other way to do it is find uh, outside financing to help you. Uh, if, you're trying to, if, if you're trying to start an idea, if you can do that, that's great. We thought we could uh, internally finance uh, the whole thing, uh, you know, if it's just through the normal savings, uh, we keep our budget is uh, on the lighter side. So to, to each their own, but, the, uh, but the, the early sacrifice does help and the really setting the right expectations. Uh, the worst thing you can possibly do is to have these outsized beliefs and hopes right. that don't materialize and, you, and you're devastated earlier on. Right. Um, if anything, you want to be the other way. Think it's harder than it actually is. And then maybe in some sense, it'll feel easier even though it's not. In your land of perfect endings or things that you want to happen, what is your end game with this? How, what would you like to see this become? What is the perfect end game for you with this? So our end game is uh, we started because we think this is something that society could use. So we're trying to provide some sort of value to society through this high quality stock producers that we're providing that we don't think exists in the same way that's out there currently. And for us, uh, really, the end goal is to uh, find enough subscribers or customers that are willing to pay for our service where it's something that we can sustain. We're not trying to build an empire or anything like that. We're just trying to be able to continue doing what we love, which is publishing really, really good, good uh, stock research content. So subscribers, whether they're retail or they're companies, but the universe of subscribers. Yes, yes. Anybody who uh, would like to buy and sell securities to make a profit. And clearly, as our business develops, our marketing strategies will be more targeted. We're still in the early stages of that. But potentially anybody who wants to make a profit on individual stocks would find what we do interesting. I think, you know, this is so interesting. And I think it shows the complexity of how much information is floating around out there. See, uh, what I think is a lot of people sit at home or in their office or wherever in their car and they're listening to CNBC and Fox Business and, you know, maybe Bloomberg, but, you know, more of the retail kind of uh, investment information outlets. And a lot of things are said, but there's not a, a lot of thought to some of them sometimes. And this is a thoughtful process. These are actual companies with balance sheets, with projections with debt, with CapEx, you know, capital expenditures, all of these things kind of are the ingredients of what you're looking at to justify an investment in a company through the ownership in a stock. I would be very interested at some point, Dea, if you're interested in having another podcast, but making it a little bit more basic, for lack of a better word, about the basics of just investing in a, and putting together a diversified portfolio and what those different components are, but also just a really kind of ABCs of stock investment for a retail investor and where they can get information from 
it, now I think a lot of people are going to be interested in your newsletter because a lot of people, that's why uh, E-Trade and Robinhood and all of these things have been so successful is people like to trade on their own behalf, you know? So my goal is for them to do it in an informed way and not like it's Las Vegas. Yes. And you're, ad you're adding to the, that mission. But I think it would be good if we at some point could collaborate on more basic, almost like a teaching tool about investing on in different types of investments, if you were up for ever doing that. Anything uh, Kim would ask me to do, I'm very, very happy to do. Kim's obviously a great friend of mine. And uh, any way we can uh, collaborate, uh, I'm all in. So, so the answer is yes. And secondarily, I think that, like you said, there's a huge need for it. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of shiny information out there that is, yes. you know, that, that is to the detriment of a lot of listeners. So uh, I think we could provide something that is useful and helpful for, uh, for uh, listeners. Yeah. And I think too, especially, you know, because this is the fiscal feminist and you are now an honorary member of the sisterhood, you know, we're trying to get women to get comfortable and not have their eyes glaze over or like break out in a profuse sweat because they're like, oh my God, this is just like too much for me to take on board. I don't want to lose all my money. And women tend to like cash more than investing, but we all know that if you hold all your money in cash, you're never going to really make any money and it will eventually run out because it's not growing. Although now you can get in the short term some higher interest rates than you have in a long time, but that's not going to be enough to get you to the end of the game. So Adea, I appreciate your time and your expertise. I think our listeners are going to really have a lot to think about after listening to this. I would recommend again that everybody check out pranasresearch.com. You can get the newsletter through there, reach out to Dea if there's some way to do that on the, on the uh, website. But thank you so much for coming today and talking to us, Daya. I really appreciate it. I respect what you've done and I wish you the best of luck. And I will be continuing to read your newsletter because I read it every time I get it in my inbox and I think, hmm, that sounds like an interesting investment idea. Thank you so much. And uh, anytime, anytime. It, it's been a lot of fun. Well, guys, that's it for this week. I think it's been uh, something that we can all sit around and listen to a few times just so we can let it go through and percolate in our brains. And I will be back at you next week. And I look forward to talking to you then. Have a great day. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at The Fiscal Feminist or check out the website, fiscalfeminist.com.